I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about bright light therapy for ADHD. Two studies directly using bright lights on people with ADHD, and in both studies, there actually was a strong correlation between how effective the light was in shifting people with ADHD's rhythms and the extent to which they had improvements in ADHD rhythms. Given the huge amount of data on disturbance of a sleep correlating with ADHD and given the small likelihood, and I'll get into some of the potential for side effects at the very end, small amount of risk, light therapy is probably something many, many people with ADHD should be considering because it's safe, easy, effective, and may be powerfully helpful. In the early 80s, they were doing research on people with seasonal affective disorder or minor depression. And as a byproduct or a result of some of that work in identifying this population of people, and we know there is a increased likelihood, disproportionate number of people with seasonal affective disorder have ADHD and the number of people with ADHD show seasonal patterns of depression. They developed what was called bright light therapy or phototherapy, shining bright lights for about 20 minutes. The morning seemed to be the most effective time and that substantially, usually fall winter depressions. It could completely effectively treat that depression for many people. The American Psychiatric Association said this effect of phototherapy on bright lights is as robust as we have for medications for general depression we should be using this treatment approach much more frequently than we do, and we should be publicizing its efficacy much more than we do. Smaller numbers of studies looking for looking at bright light phototherapy for non-seasonal depression. There's studies looking at it for eating disorders. There's two studies that have been done looking at it with benefit for ADHD. One area that's recommended to be used cautiously is in bipolar depression or bipolar disorder where it seems that it can trigger mania. There's even studies looking at it in dementia where it shows substantial improvement in cognitive functions, which is really interesting because most of the standard approved FDA medications, all they do is slow the progression of dementia symptoms. Our pupils are so good at adapting to different light levels. A light source can look bright, but not really be delivering much light. 10,000 lux seem to be about the threshold for room lighting. And to put that in perspective, a bright, bright outdoor light is often in the range of close to 100,000 lux. Indoor light is in the range of 200 to 1,000 lux. So our pupils do adjust a lot, but this is much brighter than any conventional indoor lighting scheme. Some other things that we learned about it is that you did need exposure to the retina, to the eyes. That's one of the most interesting experiments they did. Treated people with seasonal depression, either wearing dark goggles and sitting in bikinis in front of these lights. And in those days, they were all big, huge arrays of fluorescent bulbs or first steps incandescent bulbs. And the other group had were wearing essentially burkas with their skin all covered, but with eyes exposed. It was through the eye exposure, retinal exposure. It got better for their seasonal depression. Some of the other things, this is a treatment that tends to work much more quickly than medication. Many people notice improvements. Sometimes often during the treatment, usually within one to four days, people are showing substantial improvement in their depression. Usually most of the light Information from our light goes from our retinas to areas in the midbrain and then back to the visual cortex at the back of the brain. But a very small track of fibers, less than 1% of all your retinal cells and retinal fibers, cross an optic chiasm into the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the circadian clock, the innate master clock for 24 hour cycles in most mammals, including. In all animals, including humans, is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. In the earliest days, many of the light setups used bright incandescent bulbs, which got quite hot. Studies looking at fluorescent versus incandescent showed it was not the heat that was important. Other studies at that early days showed that full spectrum white light worked 
well and effectively. You didn't need the UV or infrared on the spectrum. Subsequent decades, they discovered that it was primarily the blue end of the spectrum. And many people are aware that using iPhones and computers widely at night and disrupting an evening, disrupting their circadian rhythms, that blue blocking or reducing blue light at the end of the spectrum seems to lessen the likelihood you will be doing something that impacts your circadian clock correctly. Usually when we think of a treatment or a stimuli, we think the bigger the treatment, the bigger the magnitude of the effect, that it's always pushing in the same direction. So if you take Ritalin, bigger doses up to a point will work better, and that usually they are reducing ADHD symptoms, or in someone without ADHD symptoms, they're making someone more and more agitated as you go up. However, a pulse of light at different times of the daylight cycle can have opposite effects. So a pulse of light in the evening can make your clock go later, think it's still daylight, whereas that same intensity of a pulse of light in the early morning will wake your clock up. Pulse of light at the end of the day will delay your clock. It will make you end your day later. A pulse of light at the beginning of the day will reset. Again, not just the wake up time, but the whole clock will shift. Stimuli delivered at different times of day will have pronouncedly different effects. And they've even done interesting studies where you get closer and closer to midnight. So it's not just the direction of the shift of the clock, but you get bigger shifts, bigger phase shifts as you get closer to some point in the middle of sleep time. So you get to some critical point in the middle of the night where changing the timing just a few minutes can have wildly different effects in terms of jumping the clock ahead several hours or backward several hours. And some of that speaks to the mind messing confusion of international travel and crossing several date lines. Seasonal affective disorder, there seems to be a seasonal component or a time-based component or a pattern comparison often as to hibernating animals. So giving them more light in the fall so it makes it seem like it's still spring or summer made some conceptual sense. But why would bright lights have anything to do with ADHD? Sleep problems are common in depression. It's one of the cardinal symptoms you can have on your alphabet list of different symptoms to qualify for depression. But with depression, it's only maybe two thirds of people who are sleeping too much or sleeping too little. Studies of ADHD, upwards of 80, 85% of people have not just mild, but substantial sleep problems, either insomnia, problems falling asleep, problems waking up early, getting too little sleep. People with ADHD tend to fall asleep later than their peers and wake up later in the morning. So they are shifted relative to the normal daylight cycles. And we know that there are genetic components that affect the clock and make you more prone to be a morning person or an evening person. Again, strong prevalence for evening people in ADHD and that some of these clock genes seem to be involved both in the propensity for ADHD and for eveningness in those people with ADHD, so sleep problems. We also know studies from sleep apnea. So people, adults or kids with significant sleep apnea, often have a full range of ADHD symptoms. Often it looks like they have full-blown ADHD. And if you treat the sleep apnea, either with surgery and many of these kids, it was tonsils, adenoids, other physical structures in the throat, which were abnormally large, blocking the flow of air. In adults, it's more often treatment with CPAP, but there are surgical approaches in adults and also from sleep deprivation studies. So if you keep perfectly healthy, normal people, or you keep them awake for days and days at a time, it's not just that they get inattentive. It's not just making careless mistakes and sloppy in their calculations. The full range of basic executive function problems with ADHD seem to be replicated by sleep deprivation. More impulsivity, more hyperactivity, more inattentiveness, emotional dysregulation all seem to come from creating situations where we're substantially disrupting sleep and tend to be improved if you treat the underlying sleep problem. All of this brings us closer to its logical or, or seems plausible. There is a group of researchers who think that etiology, the origin, the source of the ADHD is actually an underlying sleep disturbance. So you cause a sleep disturbance. We might again see it most represented by phase delayed sleep patterns. If you treat those sleep patterns, then theoretically we should be able to reverse ADHD. So again, that 
we don't have definitive evidence for it, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that that may be true and it may represent a large chunk of people with ADHD. So there are studies showing that if people are more alert, more active, more anchored to a waking time and regular patterns during the day, there's some studies on stimulants that sleep is actually improved. And again, the claim by some people is that it's actually the sleep improvement as much as the direct stimulating effect that's what's important. There are also some studies, particularly with our extended release forms, where, yes, we're getting some improvement in ADHD symptoms, but we're also messing, disrupting sleep on top of that. One of the most common reasons to change dose, change medications is because the medication may be disrupting sleep. There's only two studies specifically looking at groups of people with ADHD and treating them with bright light and seeing what happens. One of them goes back to 2006. This was an open trial, so it wasn't a controlled research group. The subjects and the doctors treating them knew what they were getting, less than 30 individuals. And these were actually recruited from a seasonal depression group of people. And they were being treated in the fall of the year. Bright light treatment, the standard treatment, the half hour of 10,000 lux. Best predictor for sizable improvement in ADHD was how much their circadian rhythm advanced from its delayed state as a result of treatment with the bright light. Sometimes people look at sleep patterns itself, so onset of sleep. There's also what's called a dim light melatonin onset. So melatonin is one body chemical that can be assayed by from saliva samples. So it's not an intrusive approach. So you collect samples in the evening and you can see again, melatonin tends to start rising before sleep. It's a good marker. And since melatonin secretion during the day is almost completely negligible, a rise is easily detectable. They did not find any correlation with how depressed the people were baseline or changes in their baseline seasonality of their disorder or at the baseline level of depression when it's studied. So it did not look like we were just treating depression. And that explained why people were more attentive. The second study was done in 20, or was published in 2017, not looking at people with seasonal depression. And this is looking in a more controlled fashion than a quite a small study, but the best predictor for improvement with bright morning light, how much your circadian clock advanced, people with the biggest advance tended to get the most improvement in their ADHD symptoms. So again, tiny numbers of people, if those were the only data we had behind this, this would not be something we're recommending to people, but given the huge body of information looking at the late circadian cycles and people with ADHD and the wealth of information that correcting sleep problems and also just shifting clocks. So there's studies in people with dementia that bright light again can help them as well. So a few guidelines about if you want to do this yourself. One is I would recommend there's a handful of well-respected companies, many involved in the early days in the basic or some on an ongoing basis in, in the research on circadian rhythms and seasonal affective disorder and shifting clocks. I wouldn't just go to a sharper image or anyone who says bright lights because, again, lots of lights look extremely bright, but if you're not getting 10,000 lux, it might not be enough. I don't usually recommend specific products, but for years, Siemens, the biggest light company in the world, Philips Siemens, has a product called the Golight, G-O-L-I-T-E. They bought out a smaller company that was involved in the 80s and 90s and early research in this. It's a good product. They've certainly updated. They have a blue mode. It's portable. It's tiny compared to the approaches we used decades ago. Each of the light sources, whether it's from the Golight or others, is designed to work a certain distance from your eye. So any light source, the intensity of the light falls off with the square of the distance from it, which means if you are twice as far from the bright light, this far versus that far, if you're twice as far away, you're only getting one quarter of the light. If you're four times as far away, you're only getting one sixteenth of the light. Most of the devices are made to set up about one and a half to two and a half feet from your face. You do not need to be staring at it directly. In the old days, we told people while you're drinking your coffee and reading your paper, put it sort of here in your almost peripheral vision. So it's still getting in. You 
glance at it occasionally, but again, you don't need to stare at it unrelentingly, but make sure again, it's close enough. These days while you're checking your email, you could do it. The duration 20 to 30 minutes seems to be sufficient. And again, early morning treatment were what was studied and seemed to be most effective for ADHD and clearly for seasonal affective disorder. Anyone with bipolar disorder should be pretty cautious using this because there are cases I have not seen any of them and I've worked with lots of people. There are certainly reported cases of mania being triggered by these devices. There are also some very rare retinal problems where bright light may be exacerbating them. Most simple eye conditions, short-sightedness, strabismus, glaucoma should not be particularly affected by this bright light. Commonest side effects are simple and mild. So some people have glare, headache from staring at a bright light. The blue light option usually is much gentler on people's eyes. Other side effects seem to be pretty darn rare. So that's again part of why this should be a safe and effective approach. One thing I've had many people do who couldn't be consistent with their morning medication dose or that it wasn't going into them early enough would be to set your alarm clock, wake up earlier, take it then, go back to sleep. And that, again, may be helpful in terms of not just to get the stimulants earlier in the morning so your morning's more productive, but it may be having a phase shifting effect. I've certainly seen over the years, not universally with Cymbalta duloxetine, but a number of people, they're being treated for depression or ADHD for the first time in their lives. They were always an evening person and now they were a morning person. So there may be something about taking a noradrenergic signal early in the morning that for some people can help reset their clock. Journey may also be able, particularly if you're taking it very consistently in the evening, so you're strengthening your circadian clock. There may be particular benefits there, just again, exceeding the fact that you're taking or getting a stimulant into your body during the daytime. There are a number of studies looking at melatonin for helping fall asleep in the ADHD population, where it generally appears to be a safe and effective sleep aid. A couple things about melatonin. One, for people who are used to being knocked out by a sleeping medication, Melatonin usually is not that powerfully sedating. And two of all the supplements I'm aware of, and this has been true for at least 30 years, it is the supplement where what you're taking is least likely to correlate with what the label on the bottle says. And particularly, many of the bottles contain not just less than they say, but they contain more. So there's apparently something particularly challenging about assaying or consistency. So if you find a brand of melatonin that works for you, I would strongly recommend sticking with it because if one or two milligrams of brand X works for you, you may get a radically different dose on a different formulation. That's all I have to say on shining a bright light on ADHD. Hope you stay healthy and happy 